The criminal procedure problem from February of 1999 is another fairly difficult Crim Pro essay. It's difficult because we are dealing only with one defendant and only with three items. Have a look at the call of the question. On what ground, or grounds, under the U.S. Constitution might DEFT move to suppress 1. the narcotics, 2. the statement that she owned the car, 3. the handgun, and were asked to discuss? Well, this is another fact pattern that having a good analytical checklist in your mind can come in very handy. When we're dealing with criminal procedure objections to admission of evidence, we're dealing with the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments. And we can have that little mental checklist in mind for each one of these three calls of the question. As we look at the fact pattern together, we will try to identify the different constitutional theories, and then we will turn this into a series of short answer problems about each of the three items. Go to the top of the fact pattern, and we see that a constitutionally proper wiretap provided information to give law enforcement reasonable suspicion that Deft was a cash courier in a money laundering scheme associated with a drug business. To obtain probable cause against Deft, to arrest her, and to build their case against others, they placed Deft under surveillance. So far, so good. No violations of constitutional standards at this point. They saw her drive into an office complex and legally parked the car. She left a male companion in the car and walked into the complex carrying a soft cloth briefcase. As she walked, she engaged in evasive actions the officers recognized as, uh, as methods to avoid surveillance. Still, probably no violation. Next, Deft walked into the building where the agents lost sight of her for a few moments. When she emerged and approached the car, it became evident to the agents that she was aware of their surveillance. They approached her. They asked her questions about money laundering. During this conversation, Agent Abel seized and squeezed the briefcase held by Deft. That could well be a Fourth Amendment violation. When he felt a lump he couldn't identify, he reached into the briefcase and felt a heavily taped bound object about three inches in diameter, which he removed from the briefcase. Abel will testify that he has seen such objects in the past and that they frequently contain drugs. Abel cut the package open and discovered a substance that a field test indicated was cocaine. He arrested Deft, and I think this arrest is going to be somewhat problematic. In paragraph 3, we see that without Miranda advice and waivers, Abel asked Deft if she owned an automobile. She replied she did and pointed to the car that the agents already saw her park. She refused Abel's request to consent to a search. The agent searches it anyway, finding a handgun under the, back, under the dashboard. Now Deft is in uh, custody, awaiting charges of drugs and the handgun. On what grounds, under the U.S. Constitution, might she move to suppress the narcotics, the statement, the handgun? Okay, well, let's just pause for a moment and let me give you a caveat that I have given elsewhere in this seminar and elsewhere throughout the Master Essay Method. You don't have to agree with the conclusions that I'm about to share with you. Here, I think the conclusions that I reach probably are the majority conclusions. Not that I really know what the majority answers are, but I do know one thing for sure. In this fact pattern, there were answers that were opposite from one another, but got equally high scores. So here, once again, as is so often the case, especially in criminal law and procedure, the examiners are not worried about the outcome. What they're worried about is a candidate's demonstrated ability to spot the issues and analyze the facts. Spotting the issues in this case requires, among other things, having a good mental checklist about criminal procedure objections to evidence. And remember, they come from the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments. So now turn to my outline of issues, and let me show you how I was able to sketch this out. With regard to the motion to suppress the narcotics, she will focus on the stop and on the search. I find the stop to be legal, the search to be illegal, and so I conclude that the motion to suppress ought to be granted. Next, I focus on the motion to suppress the statement. Here, I look to Fruit of the Poisonous Tree, Fourth Amendment, 
Miranda, a custodial interrogation without uh, warnings, a Fifth Amendment issue, and the right to counsel, the Sixth Amendment issue, before I reach a conclusion. Finally, I focus on the defendant's motion to suppress the handgun. Once again, fruit of the poisonous tree. To my mind, basically, that's dispositive. I also focus on the lack of consent, the automobile exception, and again, I reach a conclusion. And here, it turns out, perhaps not so surprisingly, I am very sympathetic to the defense arguments. I think law enforcement's gone too far here, and I don't think they should be allowed to benefit from their own misconduct. But keep in mind, a lot of candidates thought that law enforcement was doing a valuable service to protect the public here, and the Constitution had not been violated the way I think it has been. And the examiners were perfectly okay with that. So here, remember, we're not really looking for the correct answer. We are looking for smart and clear reasoning. So now let's focus on my answer briefly. Notice here, as is so often the case, I lead with the facts. I indicate that the defendant is awaiting trial on charges of possessing with intent to distribute drugs and unlawful possession of a handgun. I indicate up front that her motion ought to be granted based on the Fourth Amendment. Next, I focus on that analysis. I point out that the wiretap was correct, not violative of the Constitution, and that it gave reasonable suspicion to the police. And that's good enough to allow them to stop the defendant. And her evasive actions almost certainly show that the police were justified in stopping her after she exited the building and approached the car. I focus on the Terry case. The cops are allowed to temporarily de detain and investigate individuals based only on reasonable suspicion. From here, the police have a right uh, to stop her. But the search, in my judgment, goes too far. She's not stopped under probable cause. She's stopped under reasonable suspicion. That entitles the police to stop and frisk, and I say that means the pat-down search is okay, only when they have reasonable suspicion that the suspect is armed. Here, they only suspect that the defendant could be a cash courier. So I don't think the police were even entitled to pat her down. Here, the police go farther than that. They pat the briefcase, squeeze it, they find a lump, they examine it, they find drugs. Now, it is a close call here. We can argue that Abel had the right to examine the briefcase in light of all the violence associated with the drug trade. But I think the facts fall short of what would be enough to justify this search. There's no warrant, none of the typical exceptions apply, and therefore I conclude that the defendant had a reasonable expectation of privacy in her briefcase, and even though the police had reasonable suspicion to stop the defendant, they didn't have probable cause for this search. So I hold that the cocaine is the product of an unreasonable search that violates the Fourth Amendment. I suppress it. Next, we turn to the motion to suppress the statement. Here, again, I lead with the facts. After her arrest and without the Miranda warning, defendant admits she owns a car and indicates which one is hers. And I indicate up front that this motion to suppress also should be granted. And again, I offer the caveat for you. Plenty of successful candidates disagreed, along with the many who agreed with me. So we turn to the Fourth Amendment and the fruit of the poisonous tree analysis. I indicate that the defendant was arrested and cocaine was discovered in the briefcase. I think the search and the arrest were both illegal. And the police did not ask the defendant about her car until after they arrested her. I think the statement should be suppressed as fruit of the poisonous tree. I indicate that's the defendant's first argument. Next, we turn to the Miranda argument. Here, information that is obtained by police during a custodial interrogation that violates Miranda is subject to exclusion. I then focus on the facts. We have a defendant in custody for drugs, which the police already have seized. They ask her about the car because they want to get more evidence against her. I say that turns the question into an interrogation. She has a strong argument. To, that this evidence should be suppressed because it was obtained in violation of Miranda. Next, I focus on the Sixth Amendment, and here, I don't think the defendant has a good argument. I include it to show the examiners that I understand the sources of potential arguments that could favor exclusion. Criminal suspects have a right to counsel at all critical stages. Here, the defendant has been arrested, but she hasn't had charges filed against her yet. So there's no Sixth Amendment argument, and 
Ultimately, I conclude that there will be suppression of this statement based on the Fourth Amendment and based on the Fifth Amendment. Finally, we focus on the defendant's motion to suppress the handgun. Once again, I lead with the facts. I indicate that the suspect is charged with unlawful possession of a handgun and that this gun was discovered under the dashboard of her car. Again, I indicate that the police did not have probable cause to search this vehicle, and so I exclude the handgun too. And once again, I give you the, ca the caveat that many successful candidates reached the opposite conclusion. Many reached the same conclusion. I am not worried about your conclusion. I am worried about the structure and rigor of your analysis. So, once again, my analysis is going on a fairly predictable track. It's following the previous two lines of reasoning that I've already presented. I think that the fruit of the poisonous tree argument is a strong argument here for the same reasons I thought it was strong earlier. Next, I focus on the lack of consent under this particular, uh, for this search, and then I turn to the automobile exception. And, certainly, the automobile exception allows for many warrantless searches of cars. And the fact that there was a companion in the car is something that would tend to support the automobile exception, and it was a fact that was relied on by those candidates who chose to disagree with the conclusion that I present. But even so, even though there was somebody in the car, and thus some concern could be raised about evidence being lost, I don't think the police had probable cause in the first place, and therefore I don't think that the gun ought to be admitted. But notice, in the second paragraph of my analysis about the automobile exception, I acknowledge that the opposite result is possible. So although my reasoning is consistent, and ultimately I find in favor of the defendant at every stage of the analysis, even I admit that the prosecution does have enough of a case that it's possible that if the cocaine comes in, the gun comes in too. Ultimately, I conclude that the drugs were seized illegally, that the police did not have probable cause to search the vehicle, and that the handgun also should be excluded from the people's case against this defendant. And that wraps up a consideration of yet another tricky, complicated, crim pro fact pattern. Once again, the lesson is simple. You need to have a good checklist of the Crim Pro justifications for exclusion, and you've got to be ready to do detailed analysis under time pressures in order to be able to be pretty much assured of a successful result. Music